watching and listening to Conscious Evolution Media. Shifting global consciousness at ConsciousEvolutionMedia.com. Today's podcast is brought to you by Kids Talk Foundation, a global nonprofit organization providing youth advocacy, television programming, and training services in the United States, along with comprehensive medical and educational services for the developing world. Most recently in Kenya, Africa, where Kids Talk Foundation provides a feeding program, medical care, and educational services to over 1,300 young people each day. Please help our youth and place your donation. Go to www.kidstalk.org. Are you in the entertainment industry? If you answered yes and you want to promote yourself, your passion, and profession, check out Creative Independent Artist Magazines at ciaartists.com. Endorsed by Kids Talk Foundation Worldwide. Today's man needs to be whole. More than just providing financial security for their relationships and families. Join us as we explore the social conditioning that has and is systematically disempowering men. By becoming awake and aware, we can reverse that conditioning, especially for the boys. Here are your hosts of the Radical Man Internet TV show, Dr. Grant Cruley, Sensei, and Coach Steve Todd. Well, good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us. It's going to be an awesome show we have with us tonight, Mr. Doug Tenrose, and I'm very excited about that along with my co-host, Mr. Steve Toth, that founded and made the entire network and has been having quite a 2013 to start off with. So hello, gentlemen. How are you guys? Very yeah, well. Yeah. Nice to be here. <laughs> <laughs> I can't think of any other place I would want to be. Yeah, Not even a bar. <laughs> <laughs> so, Doug, uh, I was uh, looking at your at some of your stuff and watching you. You're a very fascinating man, and I wanted to lead right off with a question. Uh, what are some of the qualities or attributes in your life and experiences as things have unfolded for you that you think are unique to men or to males? I like women, but that's not unique to men anymore, is it? Uh, <laughs> um, I don't know. You I like women me, too. Doc. Yeah, you stumped me, Doc. I don't know what, what would be unique to men. I guess since so much of my life was spent hitchhiking and I'm a six foot two, 195 pound male, that I really had a lot more opportunity to go out and do that and feel more secure about it. So mm -hmm. in my life, personally, I, I don't think if I was like a five-foot woman, it would not have happened, you know, uh -huh. because there's just the safety factor, you know, because women are, are at least, I mean, I understand that uh, men have problems as well, but women are certainly threatened a lot more, and certainly under those situations, I mean, I'm standing by the side of the road hitchhiking, a guy's going to think twice about messing with me. But yeah. you get some lunatic comes along, and a woman would certainly be in more danger. So, um, you know, I guess that holds true for walking down the streets, too, or anywhere else that you are. But uh, hitchhiking most noticeably because you get into a car and you're closed into that person's world. And so uh, if, if you're not safe and secure there, it's going to be a serious difficulty. And especially for women with the sexual and the rape thing and everything. I mean, not too many people want to rape a gorilla like me, so. <laughs> so let me ask, the, way I, the way I understand the work you've done and the life you've had, you, you're, you're right out there with people and probably uh, coming into a uh, real deep relationship with people a lot of times. Other times you were probably pretty sequestered. So when I ask you that question about the guys versus like something that's unique to men, are there any kind of qualities that you that you found that stand out in your mind that are unique? That that's what I mean, because you probably lived a pretty heartfelt life because it's rough doing what you do. Um, any qualities that I have that that would that are unique to men? Uh, well, unique to you. Unique to me. 
Sam is pretty shy when it comes to himself. Yeah, well, I don't know. I mean, you're talking within a male perspective, so it's a whole different question. If you were just asking generally any qualities that are unique to me, I would say that uh, everybody's got a lot of good stuff in them, and uh, the job that we have to do is to peel off the layers of bullshit that you know our life has piled on top of mm -hmm. that wisdom and covered it up and crusted it fossilized the to a large extent in a lot of people and perhaps that I know that you know it mm -hmm. is is not unique certainly I mean you guys know it too but unusual in that there's a lot more people that are not aware how much goodness is actually in them if they would get to work on peeling away the the obstacles and the, and the layers of stuff that are recovering that good stuff up you know mm -hmm. so that, that that would be certainly again not unique I don't know if there's anything unique we're all people we all share so many qualities that uh, you know to be uh, to be unique in, in, in any one of them is certainly peculiar you know are you a practicing Buddhist uh, more so than anything else yeah I do yeah, meditation me yeah yeah. That's awesome because I saw behind you some of the some of the decoration in your house. That's very cool. So so am I. I practice Tibetan Buddhism. Oh, well, I thought you were Zen. Well, I, I do that too. But recently, oh. last two years, I ad I added uh, Tibetan Buddhism to the mix. Ah, yeah. Well, I usually I've been doing Tibetan for a long time, and have been looking further into Zen recently. Yeah. So, so uh, that's I, cool. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, and a number of other things. I mean, basically, uh, any spiritual tradition is as good as the person who's running with it. Yeah. So, uh, you know, you can't get a good, you know, uh, I've had this conversation with Steve before, a good Christian's better than a bad Buddhist, and a good yeah. Buddhist is better than a bad Christian. So, I mean, if you're going to be the kind of Christian and that's Martin Luther King or Mother Teresa, that's one thing. But if you're going to call yourself a Christian, you go out, like I grew up in a mafia neighborhood, kill people on Saturday and go to church and think you're going to bribe God with a stained glass window on Sunday, then you're not so great a Christian. And there are Buddhists like that on both sides of that equation as well, and every other spiritual practice, I'm sure. So last week, Steve... Was talk we were talking about karma, you know. So with yeah. with the kind the way you approach life is it takes so much guts. What did what did you uh, what's your thoughts on karma and, and what it taught you? Uh, it's truly the universal law. I mean, whatever goes around comes around. Not directly. I mean, if you hit somebody two times, that doesn't mean somebody's going to come along and hit you two times. But uh, in some in some manner, uh, whatever you do here is what's going to come back to you. That's why I don't think too much about reincarnation in the conventional sense of or, dying and entering another body. My second book is Reincarnation Through Common Sense, and it's more about this being reborn as a person every minute which is, uh, according to a lot of theories, what the Buddha was talking about when he was talking about reincarnation anyways. It wasn't mm -hmm. so much dying and coming back in another body. Uh, it was like, you know, like the movie Groundhog Day, where you get up every day and you've got a chance to make something better. And it just yeah. keeps happening and happening. And so in that respect, um, I think karma rules, and, and I don't really pay much attention to my karma as far as like a next lifetime or whatever nobody knows all right and, yeah. and you know people can tell you what their belief is and what they think and and uh, they can call it knowledge and um you know i have experience i've been dead i have experiential knowledge of death in this body and i still don't know but uh not too concerned about karma really because mm. you do what you're going to do because you're going to do it and if there is such a thing as a next life or whatever, then whatever you do here is what's going to, you know, what you're going to end up with there. So uh, there's really no sense to worry about it. But uh, so would yeah, you say, well, Ted, would you say so many people refer to, especially people that are religious, that uh, that there's that 
th there's a future destination uh, where we could go, either hell, <laughs> or, or or a much nicer place called heaven. But I I feel that that's actually happening right now. We get to make our own hell and heaven right here, right now. I got a line in my new book that said God couldn't be too intelligent because he thinks heaven and hell are in different places. And uh, <laughs> I don't I don't see it. I don't see it. I agree with you perfectly, you know, 100%. I mean, this is it as far as heaven and hell. And again, if there is something else somewhere else, nobody knows. But if there is something else somewhere else, be it a heaven, hell, or whatever, it's only going to be the result of what we do here. Those threads of karma will follow us into whatever, if anything, exists later on. So, um, yeah. So, yeah. Tell, uh, Ken, you said you, you had a near-death experience? or so, tell No, me I had a death experience. I, mean, I, mean, I had a lot really? of near-death experiences. But there was a period in, uh, in my late teens and early 20s where I probably died more often than most people have been alive, I think, you know. I uh, I was pronounced dead twice of an overdose. And, Is that uh, right? Uh, yeah, and uh, was pronounced, the one time I was actually dead, and they gave me a shot of adrenaline, and one guy, this I found out later, of course, I was unconscious, I didn't know, but I found out later they gave me a shot of adrenaline, and the heart didn't bring me back. And then they were ready to give up, and one doctor said, "Give him another shot." And they gave me another shot, and that one brought me back. So, wow. uh, but it's hard to like, you know. And people always ask me, "Did you see the light?" And uh, where you're going into a tunnel and all of this. And uh, all I know is that when I got up, I wanted more dope, you know. Because <laughs> when you when you're that whacked out, you you can't really, you know. So I don't know what where I do have. Uh, you know, I experiential knowledge of it, but not really. You know, yeah. uh, not so, so that I was conscious of. Ten, ten, how long did you maintain that lifestyle? Meaning, um, you know, drugs, alcohol, sex, all that stuff. How long did you maintain that? Well, let's see. Maybe I'll quit next week. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> No, I, re <laughs> <laughs> I would say from 65 to 80, it was pretty severe. And then at 19, right about 1980 or so, it started scaling down. And again, there was no, no like massive event that I suddenly turned around and said, I can't do this. It's more of a process of the addictions waning off and uh, things pretty much taking care of them. Hmm. Do you have any regrets? Out. Any regrets? Uh huh. Any regrets? Uh -huh. In a way, about no. about that lifestyle. About that lifestyle, in a way, no, because well, I mean that lifestyle. I mean the, the drug druggy lifestyle is like uh, it's like putting rocket fuel in a moped. You know, it's very wow. dangerous. I got a lot more. I lost like there was a crew of us that hung around for a year. There was fourteen, and after a year and a half, there was two of us left alive. So I have a lot of oh. regrets about losing all my friends and like that. You know, I mean, I know oh. how I know how gay people feel with all their friends being the AIDS victims. You know, because I lost just as many of mine. But um, oh. but uh, regrets. Regrets, I have a few. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so and if I let let's so, put it another way. So if I had the power, yeah, and I could take you back in time, right? Would you do it differently with what you know? Yeah, I wouldn't have done everything to the extreme that I did. Moderation, I'd come to find out later in life, is the key to life. The middle path, as the Buddhists always speak of, you know, if you. If you tighten the string too much, it'll snap, and if you got it too loose, you won't get a sound out of it kind of thing that the mm. Buddha said. So um, I would moderate everything quite a bit more, get into the kind of focus I'm starting to develop now, and uh, and the ability to concentrate a little bit more, except for that little reefer thing kind of it takes a little concentration <laughs> off it sometimes. 
Brett yeah. Dan. Do you uh, do you have a teacher? Do you have uh, like a, a mentor or anybody that you ever look to for advice? I have thousands of teachers, and uh, and as a matter of fact, there's a whole chapter in the second book that's called "Remembering Teachers," just because mm -hmm. there ain't a damn original word that's ever come out of my mouth. I mean, okay, maybe I phrase things differently. But everything comes from somewhere else. I'm going mm -hmm. to see Garchin Rinpoche this weekend. Uh, Garchin oh. Rinpoche? Yeah, he's oh. doing a thing in Albuquerque, and I'm going to go up there from here to, to go see him for the weekend, do a teaching. And uh, I go to a lot of these teachings and have over the years with uh, all you know dozens of different Tibetan lamas, and I'm constantly watching the videos of uh, John Brahm and uh, Deepak Chopra and Wayne Dow, all these people on the internet and that's and that's another thing I would have changed if I grew up earlier. All that information that was getting fed into me that I didn't realize was poison and now do, I mm -hmm. would have dispensed with that and started feeding some of this positive programming into my brain back in my youth and that I would there wouldn't have been so many overdoses. So, yeah. so based right on that, what you just said. And by the way, we're we're following uh, mostly all, a lot of the exact same people. So that's pretty cool. So huh. my my concern, you know, today is and Steve's too, because he's a dad, is the boys, and and what's going on with the media, uh, and their education and so forth, to be able to produce a manhood and a, and a sense of being a man. What's, what is your advice for, for, say, a father, fathers to pass on to their boys, especially in the formative years, like in teens? What, well, do, you, what do you say? Well, I never had any children of my own, but I've been a juvenile counselor for a little while. So I have mm. some, uh, some pretty minor experience compared to a parent, you know, mm -hmm. on this issue. But... Uh, as a parent, the best thing I think you can do is encourage your child. The massive epidemic in this country, which I think is responsible for a lot of the drug addiction, the obesity, uh, alcoholism, all those problems, there's a, a terrible self-esteem issue. I mean, mm -hmm. men, women, anybody. I mean, the system to use a word very broadly, you know, but the, the information that we're getting fed mm -hmm. is, uh, is certainly not doing folks any good, and you don't have to look too far to figure that out. You can look out your window, read a newspaper, watch the news on TV, you know, yeah. a lot of the stuff we're getting fed is producing fear and negativity. Now, with more positive reinforcement, children will grow up to have more faith in themselves and and we'll be able to achieve greater happiness and accomplishment. I think a lot of the problem, I see kids walking around today, they're bumping into trees. They don't know where to go, you know, because there's so much mm -hmm. crap that they run into when they try to go get something, you know, and it's taken for granted that you play all these butcherous video games that just kill people, uh, and then they wonder why people go out and shoot, you know, the kids go out and shoot each other in the schools. Mm -hmm. it's, right. it's just but, programmed. But nobody, nobody on commercial television is making those conclusions, nor do they connect the dots. Yeah. It's, um, uh, you know, everybody's asking. It, it, it so seems to me is that every time there is some big, big thing happening in this country where many people are dead, all of a sudden everybody becomes community. And that takes, that takes on for a week or two and then it's all forgotten <laughs> yeah. and everything is back to business as usual. And I think that's um, problem. Yeah, no, so if, if we could just focus a little bit more deeper into, from your point of view, I mean, back then where you were in your late teens, early 20s, it, it seems to me that the theme was 
to have lots of sex, lots of drugs, lots of alcohol. Was that the theme pretty much? Uh, well, we were doing a couple of other things back then, if you remember. There was civil rights, women's rights, and in the Vietnam War. It wasn't all sex and drugs and rock and roll. Yeah, we I, just figured, I know. wasn't here back then. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't... Actually, I was behind the behind the Iron Curtain, and and they uh-huh. they didn't know they didn't let us know about all this uh-huh. <laughs> because yeah, they were afraid I was, I was that too young. yeah uh-huh. they were afraid that we might um, we might want to know more about that stuff. So uh-huh. so okay so so what do you see in comparison to back then? What's happening to the youth? right now what are they hooked on they're hooked on uh, an empty spot in their heart there's nothing there they go to adults for guidance and these people are all screwed up and pumped up on prescription drugs which are supposed to be okay but them smoking pot is illegal you know I mean mom can't hit the toilet sitting down you know, for for all the pills and martinis she's got in her, but they'll yell at the uh-huh. kids for smoking a joint. You know, so many contradictions, and so many mixed messages, and uh, hate is bad. Play these video games that kill people. Right? Mm-hmm. War is bad. Uh, watch this war movie. Uh, this, it, it's it's uh, an incredible amount of mixed messaging that they're getting. So, so, here's one message that's real consistent, and this is the one that made me decide to make this show with Steve, and that is, in the media, it's a, and, and in the food, and in the, the entire system, is demasculinizing the boys. Their bodies, their hormonal levels, testosterone is now so small, it's, it's a, in white males, it's on the, on the Virgin literally going extinct and then uh, the videos and the movies are showing a constant message to these kids to follow ladies that, that uh, like Mrs. Doubtfire if he's when he's a dad he's a he's an idiot and a buffoon and the only way he has any credibility with his own family is when he dresses up like a lady and you you're a hell of a man. Like I like your the, your t- title, the fearless. It takes a hell of a lot of guts to to go out uh, hitchhiking and live on the street. I'm a martial artist and a hell of a good fighter, and I'm terrified. I I would never sleep on the street. I'd be scared someone's gonna kill me while I'm sleeping. So I don't yeah. even know how you did that. So what's what's your feelings along those lines? Have you been noticing that? Uh, definitely, but I take it a step further. I don't think they're just dehumanizing the boys. I think they're dehumanizing the humans. And uh, it's true that a lot of it is in the food. There's saltpeter and cigarettes, you know. So the and you watch all the like you say in the movies. And if you watch any of these sitcoms that are on network now, it's always some Homer Simpson kind of guy with a woman that's holding the house together. And uh, right. I don't know. You also notice a lot more black people in commercials nowadays than there used to be. I don't know if they're just trying to balance things out. Well, they're trying to sell things is what they're trying to do. They don't give a shit about nothing else. But uh, right. there is there is some kind of balance in there because women have been treated the other way for so long. Now, again, it comes down to let's treat this thing rationally and put it in the middle ground. Everybody's everybody. But for some reason in this culture, and I grew up doing it, and you know everything is extreme. It's got to be bigger and it's got to be better. So, so that you know, swing the other way. Make now that mm-hmm. we've stepped on women for a couple of hundred years, let's make the guys look stupid and make the women look smart. And it's uh, overdone in the other direction. I I would I I really think though that it's more of a problem with that they're dehumanizing humans and that they're dehumanizing uh, boys or men uh, although that is certainly happening. And who is they? Who is they? Uh, it's the people who have as their major component attachment to self-interest the ones who are trying to sell things the mar- you know, 
the the mm -hmm. the the ones who want to own everything, the ones who want mine, 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 will use any method within their power to accomplish their goals with complete disregard for how it's going to affect anyone else. And if you're bringing up children, as far as I can see, besides giving them some confidence and some self-esteem, some encouragement and praise so they have confidence in what they're doing, it would be to give them a sense of you're not the the world doesn't revolve around your butt, you know. I mean, everybody's yeah. here, so let's hold people in equal consideration. And if that was done by all the humans who are controlling the media, and mm -hmm. and and the culture, and directing the information that we're getting, of course, it's a lot better with the internet now. I mean, I can remember where there was three major networks, and that's what you got to see, and that was it. So we have a long history. Of being brought up and people were glued to the TV too as soon as yeah. it was invented so we have yeah. a long history of being fed whatever kind of garbage these people wanted to feed us for their own selfish purposes you see the commercials for the army be a hero the Navy a global force for good you know then once you join you find out you're supposed to be killing people you never met who did less to you than the people you were living with at home as far as negative yeah. action but uh, but those those people who are are in command of the the information that we're getting and own things and they're steering it in that direction it, it's I don't even think that this is not something they consider what are we doing to the people they're considering how much money are we going to get how many of these are how many burgers we're going to sell how many people we're going to get to join the army. They're not see, considering. See, I, that's one place, Tim, where I'm going to disagree with you. I, I think, based on the, on everything I've been researching, they're 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 doing exactly what you say. Yes, but they do have a plan, and they're executing it with uh, very sophisticated science. And you know, you're you're practicing Buddhism, so am I. The, my frustration is Steve's from Europe. You may notice this too. I'm not sure, but with my Asian friends, mostly uh, Japanese, but mm. China and any Asian, I can't talk about the men female uh, issues because they they don't have them. The men they don't even relate to it. The men are just doing men, and they're and they feel like men. The ladies are being ladies. They feel like ladies. And when you try to talk about this kind of discussion, or the, I bring up the demasculinizing, de they, they, can, they can't even relate to it. Have you noticed that, Steve? Is that the same in Europe? Or? Well, uh, it's totally different, different culture. Um, it's different in Europe, and it's different on the Far East. I mean, I did, I did uh, consulting for several years in South Korea, and um, I was told not to bring a woman with me because nobody will talk to her so mm -hmm. you know I was warned up front do not bring a secretary <laughs> a female because they they don't respect them in business it, it's only men that sits down at the business table and negotiate women have no place there but that's and and I believe, and I believe this is probably still that way, and I'm and I'm not going back, twelve, fifteen years. I'm not. I I don't think it's changed. Mm -hmm. In that culture. Mm -hmm. well, that's, when so, you say that the men were being men and the women were being women, but every culture has a different definition of what that is. As Steve was yeah. saying, you can't bring a woman to a meeting in in Korea. And here yeah. we're getting on the verge of having equal pay for equal work in this culture. So that's a, a positive aspect, I think. But yes. what I'm getting at is because I I train I train boys and I train men. And when I get I've I have men that actually have come to me they're as big as you. And they've they've been programmed so much that a little tiny girl, some little girl a hundred pounds who happens to have a black belt actually in reality couldn't bend his wrist if she tried. 
but he would they these guys would t talk to me in private sometimes with tears in their eyes because they believed that they were powerless i've i've uh, observed this in the boys and what i'm saying is in the asian culture that i'm aware of they they are not watching or or being programmed there's nothing in place to have boys believe that they can't make a decision without a girl holding their hand and see a guy like you if you really think about it i i do a lot of work with rites of initiation into manhood robert bly's work but if you think of a man like you i think your your way of living your whole way of living was like a rite of manhood if you think about it every, everybody can't do that that was like a proving ground that that forged you do you follow do you follow me you see yeah i do follow that? you but i don't know that it's that gender specific i think it might be a rite of passage for anyone regardless of what well, sex they I'm are not, yeah i'm not saying that women <clears throat> what i'm saying is though that the boys nowadays are not uh being given or even encouraged toward doing something that will prove to themselves at a certain stage that they become men and then it's and this is only like one little aspect of a very large gestalt right mm. media food and then the, the motivation with the money like you say uh, all of those things but the radical man is, is concerned for the standpoint of the boys for instance when i was in california if you try to make a men's group where men can just gather women will take will open up a court case and sue you so they can get in but when was the last time you heard a bunch of guys sue women so they could get into a women's group you yeah. follow me yeah you see where well, i'm going with that yeah, that's an extreme. That's that kind of taking it a little bit too far, you know. <laughs> uh, the, the equal yeah. equal pay for equal work makes a little bit more sense than that. But yeah, to, yeah. to like not be able to go into a men's thing or go into a woman's thing, uh, yeah, yeah, people carry things a bit too far, and they carry everything a bit too far. It's just uh, another one of them. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I I am I am very confused about something that maybe. Both of you could help me out with, and here's my confusion. My confusion is, is that I grew up in Eastern Europe in a communist country, and um, I would say that 10% of the population controlled 90%. Um, not the same way as as it's being done here, but same concept. Then I came over here. And I'm experiencing something very similar, that the the mm -hmm. top echelon, whatever that is, uh, whoever they are, doesn't mm -hmm. really matter for the sake of discussion, control. You know, probably over <laughs> easily 350 million or more people in this country. Mm -hmm. How and what I'm confused about is. <laughs> and and this is if you look back in history this has been this has been like this for as long as I can I can go back that I that I know something about and I don't really know much but I'm just I just don't get it that that 350 million sheep will bow down to what they're doing in Washington mm -hmm. and goes oh well everything is fine I mean my life is fine I have my house I have my car I can go to McDonald's I can go to Pizza Hut tomorrow everything is great what mm -hmm. what problems are we talking about help me to understand this yeah, it can help me to understand it too because I really <laughs> don't. I think you hit the key word there, which was sheep. And these sheep will, mm -hmm. you know, sheep will pay blindly for protection if you scare them enough. Right? Mm -hmm. So they're ready to go along with anything 
that this system says that's controlling the 350 million people here because they keep saying oh, that black people are going to mug you and the Muslims are going to bomb you and we're the ones who are protecting you, you know. And, uh, and I think people have just been intimidated into losing their stuff. All right, and when when you it's a lot easier to get revolutionary when you're not eating than when you have two cars in the garage, all right. Mm. And folks who have their own stuff, and again, it comes down to that attachment to self and mind, mind, mind kind of thing. It's uh, you know, a dog can't be no smarter than its master, and the master's going to respond the way. At both sides of this equation, I mean, you could say that that Hitler was such a bad guy, but without the impetus of the German people behind him, feeling that same way and ready to follow, that guy would have fallen off like the second-rate lieutenant that he was and disappeared into non-history. And the same thing is true in America here. You, you know, everybody blames the politicians and the leaders and the people who are running things, but, uh, you know, who, who's, who's really... Should be may I, may I offer Please. you something here? Please. Because it, this is my actual area of expertise. The the answer lies, and that's why the when I said that they're doing the media with the very exact science, because it's it, and the, if you know Bruce Lipton, and you know who, uh, um, I, uh, Nassim Harmi and all the uh, William Tiller, some of those great scientists are. Greg Braden, they're all explaining all of this, and then in the bi big business moguls, John Asaraf and that, they're bringing in the biggest neurologist to explain. It's just the subconscious mind, Ten. All they do, the media puts the brain into a theta brain wave pattern. They program the subconscious mind. They have a ticker, they have a ticker uh, rate on the TV. It works uh, even if they're not watching the screen, as long as the TV is on. And then uh, that's how you get people to buy a, uh, they'll say, uh, a medication. And then if you listen to the end of it, I just heard one uh, two days ago. It says, when you take this, one of the side effects is cancer. If you're not <laughs> right. feeling well, uh, call yeah. your doctor. But people are but falling But it cures your acne, themselves. right? Yeah. Yeah. An anal leakage. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so, anal, anal, so what they do is, on, on a mass scale, the average uh, American now watches six to eight hours of some form of media a day. So wow. they are accessing the subconscious mind with specific science. And then they can, and then for the foods, like for the diabetes, they've uh, engineered the molecules so that when you eat, instead of the brain getting a message that I'm full, it gets a message saying, eat more. They manipulated the, the molecules. So that's why you see a, a, a 500 pound person walking in and stuffing their face in the McDonald's. They're literally being lured like fish, and it's an exact science. Yeah, they're joking. So, yeah, they, and, and they're being literally forced into, so what, you, what the only way out of this is like the Dalai Lama says, it's, you've got to be, in, we've got to increase awareness. The problem is the subconscious mind is a one million times a greater processor than the conscious brain. Conscious brain is only active 5% of the day and it's one million times weaker. So the subconscious mind is ruling and, and there, there you have this mental matrix and that's how you can control. That's why Hitler and those boys, they'll say, if I want to control the country, all I got to do is control the kids. Once you yeah. control the kids, you know what I mean? So yeah. there's your answer, Steve. That's how they do it. Yeah, and that's and the, the science. An and the answer to fixing it is not with getting rid of those people. I mean, those people have to be gotten rid of. But I think the answer to fixing that, and I don't doubt every word you just said, I believe it, but um, it's the people that have to change it because it's not yeah. going to change from those controllers. So, in no. other words, when you're talking about bringing up boys properly so they have some self-esteem, they have some faith and confidence in their own mind, they have yeah. some positive information that they're brought up with since birth, 
I mean, it would be nice to have a couple of emotional intelligence classes in the schools to go along with the reading, writing, and arithmetic, but that's basically the responsibility of the parent at home these days to get those kinds of things into their child from birth to five and institute it into the school system. Uh, it, it has to happen on the individual level because there's no way that these folks are going to start, you know, have some sudden revelation and say, hey, I'm being a real jackass to a whole lot of people. I got to stop this. I don't think yeah. it's uh, in their makeup. Yeah, I, I, you're, a, you're a thousand percent right. The big problem is it's uh, the masses, the sheeple, they, it, uh, what do you call, uh, people, people, they, they're, what they do is they use fear and it, it gets the amygdala in the brain. And the amygdala is an automatic, so it it loves it loves and it's attracted to things for defense. So they use fear-based stuff, and then people follow in flocks. You know what I mean? Like uh, imagine a guy like you. I mean, if I was a 16-year-old boy, or if I had a boy, imagine I I can imagine them being mentored once a week, once a month. For a few hours from an older man like you that has all the experience you have or a man like Steve uh, but they they need that nourishment from an older man not from an older lady because they're men I'm not saying anything against ladies and as a matter of fact next week I've got a lady coming on uh, my first lady guest Steve next week but the point is a boy needs to learn from a man he takes nourishment from that. Hell, I'm 56, and I always seek out older men, and I learn so much. I get so much from uh, from them that inspires me, because they they they've done so many things. They understand things from a man's way. Does that make sense to you? Do you agree with me? Yeah, a little bit, a little bit. I mean, I don't I don't see quite that gender split there. You know, hmm. how come? I, I don't, I don't know. You see, I mean, there's a whole bunch of people that got brought up by single mothers that turned out to be decent men and damn good basketball players too. But uh, you well, know. a basketball player isn't a measure of a man. <laughs> no, you know, no I used to, I used to bodyguard uh, professional basketball players, <clears throat> and they were a pretty mixed up group of young fellows. Yeah, you know what right. I mean? they they bounce a ball real good. Yeah, but uh, did you also know? Like, have you ever read uh, some of the literature? Like, a lot of the guys that are uh, not all of them, of course. There's exceptions to everybody. Um, George Burns smoked, uh, and he never got cancer. But yeah. a lot of the boys or men, they find when they get about 30 years old, 30, 35, mm -hmm. they have a big gaping hole right in the center of their chest regarding their own manhood because they never got nour nourishment from their dad. Have you ever read some of that stuff? Nah, I'm sure that it happens, you know. Yeah, I bet you'd find it interesting. Yeah. Robert Bly, I recommend Robert Bly. Book is called Iron John. It's yeah. awesome. It's awesome stuff. Okay, like so it? let me, ha hang on for a second, Sensei. So let me just put a different perspective on this for a second. Okay, because, um, and this is for our viewers as well. So, so you guys know that I've been doing this uh, network for more than nine years, and I've noticed this myself, just from mm -hmm. personal experience, not by reading something or telling you something that somebody else told me. This is from personal experience that, you know, tens of thousands of people have come through this network in, in one, way or another as a as a host as a guest as somebody that's watching viewer keep coming back and what i found interesting is that the the ratio of women and men on our network so you can kind of look at this as a laboratory as a self development laboratory and i feel that it's a it's pretty much a mirror of what's happening in the world. Mm -hmm. So the ratio is probably an 80-20. 80% of the people that come through here are women 
and 20% are men. Yeah. And 80% of the women that come through here, including hosts, guests, are all speaking about and organizing women to become more powerful and to support each other to be able to live their passions. I have no issue with that whatsoever. I love it. Okay? Here's the here's the problem. That the men that are coming through the network are pretty much lone wolves. They don't talk about matter of fact women come right out on our shows in our network and say, I only want to work with women. I don't want to work with men. <laughs> so what you said 10 earlier is that we haven't learned a damn thing from our past because the women now doing the same thing that what we have done to them. They went the other, the, on the other end and excluding men just like the way we excluded women so how are we going to come together in the middle if yeah. we if we keep doing this well that's the come together part is uh you know I, i'm on the wrong program here i think because i'm not that gender specific i don't if women want to work together just with women great men want to work together just with with men that's great uh I think it's all about humans working together. And uh, a lot of these problems disappear when any people really work together. Because uh, obviously there is a difference between a man and a woman, but we're all humans and that's personally, just for me personally, and, and again, it's wonderful work to focus on helping boys grow up to be men and girls grow up to be women. but. Um, I, I really, this is not my area of expertise at all because I just pretty much strictly pay attention to people growing up to be better people, you know, without well, those I, differentiations. I, so it's not not my area. What I well, what it's you, it's you know, all of us's area because you male, I'm male, uh, sensei is male, and we operate in the world as males. And, and I, I don't have, I mean. I, I'm, sorry. I, I look I'm an executive producer of a now. TV show that all I have around me are women. Right. <laughs> so it's not like it's not like you know I pick and choose. It is whatever 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 happens the way who I am being in the moment is what creates my reality. So I don't I don't have anything against women. It's just I'm sharing some statistics with you that I think is it's interesting because men it seems to me that men are having having some issues working together and supporting each other in the world today the only place I have noticed men are working together but not really it's in corporate America <laughs> in and the they army. do it and, and in the army and in, in, <laughs> in corporate America they do it because of the money and I don't know why they do it in the army because I would never <laughs> sign up. I would never sign up to be in the army. Never. Can I can I offer something to ten? Because I I understand your heart on this ten. So let me say it in, in another way. Because I'm also concerned with uh, humanity. Uh, uh, and 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 more, and even more than humanity, I'm I'm concerned for. The animal life and the planet because we're the ones destroying it. it's innocent but here let me offer it to you this way uh, you have a, a people and and they're all human beings and there are certain things that uh, nourish the archetypal uh, primordial energies that make up a woman and there are uh, certain things that uh, nourish Males, and there, and then there is a whole area that nourishes both males and females. So this is the. Uh, I don't want you to feel defensive that this is a thing against ladies. This is what I, what we did. Steve and I got together. This is a thing that is looking at the nourishment 
that for male specific that because there are certain things and I'm sure you're aware of this that are uh, different and important for men and there are things that are different and important for ladies and then there are things we come together because uh, individuals are, are equal but there's differences uh, 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 do you follow me? so it's not a either or or an against thing that's what uh, my questioning that's what Steve, that's what we're that's what we're doing this isn't some kind of a adversarial scenario uh, oh no i but understand uh, that and i appreciate the work you're doing with this specific you know male thing and i appreciate the work that women are doing with their specific woman thing it's just not my area you know it's just yeah. not my area. I focus on humanity as a whole. The people are people, and uh, everybody's got the human qualities. And if you nurture them, there's a common denominator there. Give love and kindness and proper direction, encouragement, uh, proper programming, uh, keep people away from the neg negativity and towards the positivity. I, I mean, you know, I've had a rough life. I don't have that many brain cells left. I can't concentrate uh, and separate into the male and female. I just see a big blur picture of humanity here, all right? And, uh, I, you know, I'd be the first to admit this is not my area we're talking about here. Are, are there any... Are there any yeah, well, I respectfully, I respectfully disagree because uh -huh. humanity includes men and women. You... Yeah. You can't separate. And there's no such thing as you being on the wrong program. If this was the wrong program, you wouldn't be on it. No. Period. <laughs> <laughs> Believe me, buddy, I've been on some wrong programs before. <laughs> are, there, <laughs> are, there, are there any great men uh, or men that you consider great that, uh, that you think are an inspiration to the world? Oh, thousands. Thousands. I mean, and pretty much all the llamas. I look up to them. You know, they're all men. Um, Why do you look up to them? Why do you look up to them? Because they're such wonderful people. They they're beyond really focusing on on a lot of the stuff that humanity normal normally focuses on. They okay. have gotten a lot of that crap scraped off of their happiness and their. Uh, more controlled by their conscious mind than their subconscious, which, as you said before, and very rightfully so, is quite a trick these days. And uh, and that's it. But I have no extra admir. I mean, the Pema children, and there are several nuns. Mother Teresa, you can't go any better than that. You know, yeah. there's a lot of people that I look at. Uh, I, I just, I don't, when I look at the llamas like that, it's not that they're, I, I look at them like great men. I look at them as great people. How about some military guys? Like uh, if it was people oh, like sorry. Patton. I can't use them. <laughs> if, if we didn't, if we didn't have uh, Patton and so forth, uh, uh, Hitler and the, those boys would have destroyed us and uh, they would have won. So, uh, What's your thoughts on some of those guys? They give their life so that you and I, so you could, so you could go hitchhiking. You'd never go hitchhiking, hey Steve. If the if the Nazis had taken over, pretty hard to go hitchhiking. So, uh, what do you think about something like that? I'd be hitchhiking anyways. They'd have to shoot me on the road. But they would. That's the that's the point. See, they they well, kill you. Well, they would. And I'll keep hitchhiking, and there's other people who will keep keep hitchhiking until we figure out a way to get them to stop shooting people who are hitchhiking. <laughs> yeah. I, I I understand. It worked for Gandhi. Go into you know the that river would work. when they were getting the salt. You know, it worked for Gandhi. Well, but but Sensei, what you're Gandhi. talking about is. You know, humanity has gone through this from the beginning. Is that there's always somebody, either one person or an entire nation, that has something up their butt, where they want to take over the entire world. I mean, we've been we've been over this many times, and then all of a sudden, somebody else comes along and saves the day. Gandhi, Gandhi wasn't. And then they turned into the enemy. 
And as yes. soon as that somebody else comes along and saves the day, they turn into the asshole, and then somebody yes. else has to come along and save us from them. Yes, and, and it's, it's happening right now. I, I believe it's happening right now in this country. Exactly. It is. Exactly. It is. You know, we saved the world from Germany. Because we've been saving the world save for the world a long time. America. And oh, who's going to save us, Dan? Yeah. Good question. <laughs> I think Do it's you have a good have candidate? The Chinese? It's Are they going to save us? us. <laughs> That's going to have to be international. I mean, there's a, this, this thing is about to end one way or the other. It's been a long, long time of one bunch of people, a country, or, or a leader with a bug up is as just as Sensei said, attacking somebody else. The English has done else. it. They want to take the English has done it. The French has done it. The Germans have done it. The Russians everybody. have done it. I mean, everybody. over and over and over. This is no answer. This is no answer because it'll never stop like this. The, the thing to do is like, all right, look after World War II, right? All right, so we had trouble with Germany and with Japan and France and Germany, the things that they had going on together. France and Germany will now no more ever go to war that you'd have a better chance of winning the lottery, you know? The U.S. and Japan are in such economically wound up together that they're never going to kill each other either. So the key to all this isn't having a, a bigger stick to hit the other guy with because somebody else is just going to get another bigger stick further on the line. It's trading in competition for cooperation. Well, see, I, 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 and I understand all that, but that's not what I was getting at. What I was trying to get at is the qualities of a man in a position to try to save the lives of the country. I, I'm, I'm referring to the internal qualities of the individual, and I wondered if there were any of those kind of individuals that you uh, found to be virtuous. This, I, I'm, I, I, I have my own thoughts about the country and, and the politics and all that stuff. I don't think they'd be very popular, <laughs> but uh, I'm referring to, do you, I probably do you agree follow what I'm mostly. saying? Yeah, I imagine we would. But but do you see what I'm getting at? I was just wondering from that perspective. Uh, no, not really. I don't have any admiration for any of them. I can't think of a military figure that I would have as much respect for as I do for uh, Gandhi, Martin Luther King, all the, the concrete really serious changes because military doesn't change anything, it just shifts who the asshole is for the day and then the next day you have a different one whereas the changes that Gandhi and the Dalai Lama is trying to make and Martin Luther King made and Mother Teresa made it through kindness and those other guys made it through nonviolent action those are the ones that catch on those are the so ones that get into people's hearts oh of course but let so I, and I, no one could disagree with you if they had a brain. But let me ask you this: like, if, if you had a family, or you have someone that you really love, and some people come to try to beat the hell out of them or kill them, will you fight to defend them? I'd like to think I wouldn't be in that position. There's some kind of intelligence that allows me to sidestep people who are trying to kill me, as a rule. I don't walk no, not down you. dark not, alleys. Not big you. Yeah, I don't. Not, not I would, you. Yeah. I mean, I mean, if they come like just the other day, just down the road, half hour from my home in Georgia, two guys drove up just the other day. They just drove up in broad daylight, and the lady was walking. She was carrying her little one-year-old baby, and they said, "Give me your." They said, "Give us your money from the car window." She said, I'm sorry, I don't have any money. I'm just walking my baby. I think the uh, baby was in a crib. They blew a hole in her leg, and then they shot the baby through the head. And so if you were walking somewhere, anywhere, but there's people you love, I'm sure there are guys you love or women you love, and someone or something comes after them, would you fight to defend them? Yeah, no That's doubt. my question. No doubt survival is a basic human instinct, and even if it wasn't my family, if it was a stranger and I see him getting beaten up, I try to stop that. But you're talking about wars between countries. This is like, uh, you know, anytime you have a war, they got like a little bit of 
of like, oh, this is the right thing to do and the moral aspect, and it's a brick facade behind three feet of solid economics. All right? I know. When you're talking know. about wars between countries, you're not talking about some lunatic trying to kill your family. You're talking about a bunch of greedy jackasses manipulating people, not caring if other people's children die so that they can take in more money and feel more power and feel bigger about themselves and I own know. everything. So it's a I whole know. different situation, I believe, you know, than but that. See, but, but of see. course, of course, to answer your question, I certainly would. I mean, it's a natural human instinct, survival and protection. It is just natural. Where the screwed up part is, is that the convincing these kids that the economic violence that they're causing, which is the bigger scale stuff, and, mm -hmm. and also responsible for influencing the minds of a lot of the people who commit the smaller grade stuff on the street, just yeah. attacking individual families, they're convincing them that there is that kind of a moral, you're gonna think of what these, I remember with the Russians, they'll come over and rape your grandmother, these are terrible people, blah, blah, blah. And people just like any other people, you want their money, that's all. And you're going to try yeah. to convince us to kill them because we can take their money after we kill them. That, you know, and every it's army, a game. we already know every army rapes the enemy. There's nothing new yeah. about that. All right, so I have a feeling that Sensei may not be watching the clock. I, so I, I want to make, <laughs> I I make sure that we don't get into another long fascinating discussion so I want to make sure that Ten has an opportunity to talk about uh, his book and also oh, okay. your website and your contact information so please Sensei it's been a pleasure I mean I don't want you to think that I disagree with you because I agree with you 100% on almost everything you said but it's just my focus is different the yeah, focus you, is you a focus different. causal yeah you're yeah. focusing causal and I, and I respect that so much I'm just I was thinking situational, and I right. wanted to see how, what you saw, thought situationally. But but like Steve says, use this time and and uh, and tell us about yourself so that you so you get that out there. And okay. I, it was an honor. It's an honor to meet you, sir. The honor is mine. That's been uh, wonderful. I very much know. appreciate it, and I hope we get to see each other again. Yeah, uh, me too. Okay. So tell us the about book. the book. All right, there are two books. Fearless Puppy on American Road is the first one, and then Reincarnation Through Common Sense is the second one. These books are actually not books. They're funding vehicles for a project to sponsor wisdom professionals, beginning with but not exclusive to Tibetan monks and nuns. And wow. uh, all, all the profits from there, well, all the author profits anyways, I can't tell the publishers and people, other people what to do, but all the author profits are going to go to sponsor that cause. And that's wow. really the only reason I ever wrote the books. Uh, wow, uh, that's beautiful. Yeah, yeah, well, the books themselves, people tell me I've written a couple of pretty good books by accident. Since I mean, I'm not an author, but I guess I accidentally wrote some real good books because I'm getting like rave reviews <laughs> in the paper and stuff like That's that. That's awesome. And every, people read them and they say I've gotten something out of them and they, they kind of helped my life and I tried that thing that you said in the book and it worked and made me feel better. That's awesome. blah, blah. So that's a nice little ancillary benefit, but really they weren't written for that. The main point of the whole thing and the only reason I wrote the books was in order to sponsor the project. And the website awesome. is www.fearlesspuppy.org. Uh, thank awesome. you very much. Awesome. Yeah, thank you. Awesome. Thank you, so, Steve. So, so Tana, yeah, thank I want to, before we go, I just want to acknowledge you from from my heart because when when I am in your presence, then what I'm what I'm present to. I think you're talking to him. No, I'm talking to you. <laughs> See, a lot of givers have a hard time receiving. So I'm going to make a request that you receive what I'm about to say to you because I, I am doing it from my heart. So, so when I'm in your presence, then, what, what, what I'm present to is your simplicity and, and your wisdom. And sometimes the way you say things so simply that it's 
that it's unarguable. <laughs> it is. It is. It is just the matter of fact of your truth, and I absolutely love that about you. Well, I thank you very much. I appreciate you saying so. I won't go into the fact that I'm so simple because I only have two brain cells left after doing all the drugs. <laughs> but okay. <laughs> 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 okay, well, that's that's a comedy show. <laughs> it is now. Oh, I forgot to mention George Collins' line. Speaking of comedy show, did you ever see George Collins, Sensei? I believe I have. I know the name. I'd have he's to have like, see his face. He's a great comedian, and he did a whole routine about the continuing pussification of the American male, which I think you'd get a big kick out of. <laughs> I like that that's a lot. What he called it. That's what he called it. I get really, it's a shame he's dead because he'd be an all star on this show. Uh, <laughs> you'd get a real kick out there. I'm going to see if I can locate it on YouTube. That sounds great, man. Uh, well, well many years ago, I was going to write this book, and the title was going to be Men Will Do Anything and Everything for the Vagina. Yeah. <laughs> there's, there's another comedian, uh, Doug Stanhope, says that uh, talks about that, and that's the whole reason we go to jobs, and that's the whole reason why vagina is so hard to get, and they put restrictions on it because if you do that, the show is just starting, <laughs> Sensei. <laughs> you know? oh, Nothing man. They put and restrictions on it. It's easy to get. Nothing would get built because guys wouldn't be motivated. To, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, Sensei, now nah, you good. just got. <clears throat> Sensei, you just got your explanation. Why man is behind everything that's being built? Uh, there you go. <laughs> Uh, maybe one day we'll uh, we'll all collaborate on a book. That's a <laughs> that would so be listen, a pleasure. Thank you so much, and uh, God bless uh, that work for, that you're doing for the Buddhists. I I love that. That's awesome. Uh, and that's and awesome. God bless what you're doing too. If there was a God, that is. But whatever yeah. there is out there, <laughs> let him bless you. And uh, her, <laughs> maybe her. It could be her. Uh, yeah. You never know. Yeah. Yeah. Right, Guru Rinpoche, right. Padma Sambhava. Okay. Go. Yeah, that's, right. that's, that's my mantra. Vajra Guru Mantra. Cool. So, uh, with that, uh, well, I guess we're going to say goodnight, but thank you so much. It was just a great show. Steve, thank you. And uh, remember, you guys that, that are listening to this, try to, try to honor yourselves and honor your life. And we'll see you later. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you all. Have a good night. Good night. Good night. See you all next week. Yeah. Bye bye. You, you, you too. Well, bye. Bye-bye. Today's podcast is brought to you by ObesityHotline.com, the silent killer, providing support and encouragement in the prevention of this rising epidemic. Featuring the Body by Vi Challenge. Is there a quick answer to the question? Go to www.obesityhotline.com. You're watching and listening to Conscious Evolution Media. Shifting global consciousness at ConsciousEvolutionMedia.com.